What's going on everybody? Gem Mint here with today's new comic book day reviews. It's Wednesday, October 12th. Getting this out a little bit late, man. I've been busy, but we got a ton of books to review. First of all, I'm going live on Whatnot later today, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. I got a ton of key issues to give away. First appearance of Midnight Suns in a 9.8. I got a raw copy too. I'm not really sure which books I'm gonna give away, man. I got a whole stack, first Phantom X, we got uh, classic X-Men one, Wolverine one. We got the first Bishop, first Rogue, uh, first Carnage. I got a ton, all giveaway stuff right here. Plus I got some New York Comic Con exclusives left over, regular uh, ratio variants and more. And speaking of whatnot, I did get a chance to read the first four books from Whatnot Publishing. So instead of giving a biased review, I'm just gonna give you the gist of it and you guys can determine you know, for yourselves if it's something you wanna read. So I've been talking about Ninja Funk for months now. This is by JPG, that's Spider-Man booth, and he's joined by creators uh, Steve Shewitt and Alex Regal. So this cover is very much what the interior art looks like. It's got a raunchy kind of Kevin Eastman, but in the future type of vibe to it, both with the art and the storytelling. So it's saving the universe from bad music. Bad is an acronym. It's the evil corporation in this book. The frequency of the universe is off and they're trying to get it to the perfect frequency, which is funny. That frequency that they mention in here, I have a friend in the music business and they always say like that's the frequency that has like what the most hit records or something like that. It ties into music. They give you a list of songs that you're supposed to listen to during the action sequences, and you follow the three characters. JPG McFly is the TV head guy. You've got Wolfgang, which is kind of like a lion cat type of character. Then you got Laser Wolf. So the three characters are like a ragtag group of mercenaries that are unlikely allies, and they have to save the universe together. So that's the premise on Ninja Funk. Then we've got Alpha Betas. This is by the co-creator of Rick and Morty, and you get Rick and Morty vibes and art style through this. Uh, Michael Calero's on here, Kyle Starks, um, Micaiah Myers, and Trevor Richardson, Kenny Atkin, and edited by Simone Ori and Michael Calero. So, Alpha Betas, it's got, like I said, that style uh, that's kind of like Rick and Morty, and it's these four characters that are inside of a video game. They're playing online together, and they end up running across characters that we learn are within the game. There's something that's gonna happen in the outside world that's gonna destroy the world, kill millions, and now they're the only hope to stop it. So it's funny, it's uh, got you know a lot of humor to it, it's got that kind of cartoonish vibe to it, but with a different premise. I kind of actually was really into it. Then we have The Exiled. This is the Wesley Snipes book, and uh, the creative team is Lawson, Aram, and Esquivo. So this is a black and white book. You have the main character, um, Roach, which is like the Wesley Snipes type of character, kind of like a Simon Phoenix type of vibe is what I got from it. But it's post this Red Friday aftermath where everything was destroyed and you have this murderer who's going around ripping out spines like Sub-Zero and Roach is trying to find out who that is. So that's the Exiled. And the last one was Quested. Quested is by Michael Calero as well, Kit Wallace, who we've seen on Mr. Easta, and Thomas Parson. So this is kind of like a... Uh, a Zelda type of story, save the princess type of vibes, same type of color and uh, aesthetics as Mr. Easter, which comes out today as well, I believe. Uh, I liked Quested as well. I think Exiled is the more universal one where I think more comic book readers are gonna dig that, but then Alpha Betas, Ninja Funk, Quested have that fun type of cartoonish vibe to it. Not too serious, but great dialogue and humor. So that's the books from Whatnot Publishing. Speaking of Mr. Easter, Scout Comics, I got a chance to get an early look at Eternus issue two. This is the Andy Serkis book. He's joined by Andrew Levitas, Anastasia Davis, and Don Hanfeld. So this is the story of Hercules on the search to find out who killed Zeus. He's joined by this blind girl who was a servant to Medusa. Love the stuff they did with Medusa in this book, man. This is a great story. I hear it's definitely gonna be a movie, so jump in on that Eternus. Some dope stuff there. Let's jump over to Marvel Comics, guys. So we have Amazing Spider-Man, issue number 11. This is the return of Hobgoblin. Wells, Ramita Jr., Hannah, and Menyes. I dug this issue. Marvel's gotta stop killing these runs with obligatory, obligatory tie-ins. Uh, this series is not too bad when it's just the main series. Now, John Romita Jr.'s art is not my favorite. 
He tends to have a very blocky art style. But uh, Hobgoblin Returns, you have Roderick Kingsley, you have Ned Leeds, and you have Norman Osborn. It's kind of like who is Hobgoblin. Peter's trying to uh, figure out who that is and you know stop whatever he was doing. I forgot he kidnapped somebody or something like that. I dug Amazing Spider-Man. Daredevil issue four, Chip Zdarsky. I feel like it's Chichetto as well. This cover doesn't say. I don't know. I just feel a little bit bored with this run so far. The Daredevil's going to uh, form a faction of the hand called the Fist. I don't know. Kind of felt like Ninja Turtle vibes here. The artwork is great. I just feel like, I don't know, not much going on in Daredevil to get excited about. Venom 11 is here. This is the uh, Rom V written issue because he shares this title with Al Ewing. Hitch, Curry, and Sinclair. So we got bombs dropped on us on the last Venom issue. I don't want to get into too much spoiler territory, but all of those King and Blacks in that garden, we find out who that is, and now we're back to the Dylan Brock story. So what's interesting here is Dylan is unconscious from the events that happened to him in the prior issue. So he is being carried around by the Venom symbiote. His consciousness is... Basically, he's the symbiote, and the symbiote is the host right now. That's kind of like the thing here. Sleepers being brought up in here to uh, to rescue Dylan Brock while his body is separated from his mind. Trippy stuff going on in the pages of Venom. Wolverine 25 is here. I'm kind of surprised that I'm still sticking with this run, man. Benjamin Percy, uh, Vincentini, D. Armada. This is a Judgment Day Axe tie-in which should have come out prior to the X-Men one-shot last week because in that one-shot... Wolverine mentions how, I guess, spoiler alert, he passed judgment. And we're supposed to just kind of brush that off, I guess. I mean, this issue comes out a week later, and it, it shows how and why he uh, was judged the way that he was judged. He's with the Iraqi warrior who has the skin made of uh, adamantium. Solemn is his name. I'm, I can't believe I've remembered that. Uh, in, the, uh, in the snow, in the mountains, and, and again, we, we see why he was judged the way he was judged. It was all right. X-Force issue 32, also Benjamin Percy, but he's joined this time by Gil and Guru EFX. I kind of like this Craven infiltrating Krakoa kind of thing. We get the return of Omega Red, the confrontation with Omega Red and Deadpool after he was left to rot and die. But uh, obviously that wasn't going to happen. But I love this kind of Craven's last hunt on Krakoa. It's kind of dope. On to Ghost Rider issue 7. Benjamin Percy again with Smith Jr. and Valenza. See, that just goes to show you. You can like an artist. You can like a creative team. doesn't mean you have to like everything that they write. I don't really feel like that Wolverine ongoing series is a strong series. I love this Ghost Rider run. It feels like throwback 90s. Like they go out of their way to paint this picture of the supernatural and the macabre and that whole section of Marvel Comics. I mean, look at the cover. It's giving me like text vibes. It's transforming his face from skin and flesh to bone and flame. Uh, Johnny Blaze had the demon uh, lobotomy by Wolverine in the last issue. So he's in the aftermath of that, setting on a new adventure. And we get a new villain. First appearance, I guess, Exhaust, which is a shadow of Johnny Blaze's Ghost Rider. And he's creating shadows of himself. Basically, this shadow army is being uh, built here. So digging the hell out of Ghost Rider. All right, so there's a couple different Axe books. I'm trying to keep them all together. But Death to the Mutants, Issue 3. I guess this was a miniseries tie-in. And this is dealing with the progenitor, the Celestial Judging Earth, trying to carry out that sentence, ready to destroy the machine that is Earth. But we get some insight from the machine and how it's kind of fighting back, how we have to go into the brain of, of the world, the essence of Earth, do a hard reboot, straight-up Jurassic Park style with Phaistos, uh, and, and I thought it was a dope issue, man. I really like this miniseries. I think it's important to the overall story. And I like seeing Earth not letting itself die so easily. And the next Axe one shot was Eternals issue one. So this is all taking place within the progenitor. We see the perspective from Iron Man with the Avengers one shot, Jean Grey from the X-Men one. And now we have Cersei here with this one. So we see why she was judged the way she was, and what role she's playing representing the Eternals within this kind of rescue team to try to stop the Progenitor. Now, they draw back to some stuff that happened in the Eternals run, which I kind of forgot, man. The Eternals are immortal, but when they are resurrected, they have to kill and inhabit a human body in order to come back. So that's kind of weighing on the conscious, uh, conscience of some of the Eternals, and that plays out here as well. I'll tell you what, man, I ended up really liking this whole Axe Judgment Day event. Uh, I know that's kind of like uh, 
I don't want to say it's an unpopular opinion. I think some people like it, some people don't. I'm on the side that likes it. With all these tie-ins and with so much story, we got to get an omnibus for this. We got Namor, the Submariner, Issue 1, Concord Shores, starting this new series, Christopher Cantwell, Ferry, and Hollingsworth. I wish I could say I loved it. Didn't really dig it. Takes place in the future. It's kind of like Waterworld. Um, the Kree had one last battle with Earth, melting the polar ice caps. Namor is no longer the king of Atlantis. He's kind of like a little bit rogue, but he's still part of Atlantis. I don't know. It's a future type of story. I'm not really digging it. A surprise hit for me was Punisher War Journal Brother. This is, a, I guess, a one-shot by Grotenbeck, Pimentel, and Milla. So I mentioned not really liking the other Punisher one shot. Love Jason Aaron's ongoing. I think it's great storytelling. This was a dope ass one shot. This is basically the dark web pulling in their resources and money to put the biggest hit out on Punisher possible. You're getting uh, $250,000 just for a sighting. You're getting 500 grand for a picture. And everybody, every mercenary in the world is on their way to try to take down Frank Castle for the greater good of crime. That doesn't really work out too well for them, and I thought it was a dope-ass issue. The last one I read from Marvel, I skipped a few, man, uh, is Wakanda Issue 1, starring Shuri, uh, Stephanie Williams, Medina Wong, Diamacchio, and Valenza. There are two stories here. One of them was the history of the Black Panthers. I only read the first main story, and it really spins off of the current Black Panther run, and I stopped reading that after the first arc. You can still figure out what's going on here with that, but... I don't know. I just don't care enough about the run to, to really have cared enough about this issue. I just thought it was okay. It's Wakanda without T'Challa as a leader. Shuri steps up. I guess they're, you know, they're setting the scenes for the movie. I won't pick up issue two. This video is brought to you by Ninja Funk. Help save the universe from bad music by picking up a copy from your local comic shop on November 2nd. Check out these amazing variant covers as well. We have two from Tyler Kirkham, one of them being a 1 out of 25 ratio. Tony Fleece with the Stray Dogs, 1 out of 10. Kevin Eastman with a 1 out of 100. And Boss Logic with a 1 out of 250. Big shout out to JPG from that Spider-Man booth, Street Level Hero, and now Ninja Funk. Which brings us on over to DC. We're going to start with Batman vs. Robin, issue two by Mark Wade. He's joined by Asrar and Bel Air. I liked issue one. I didn't really dig this one as much, man. The Devil Neza stuff, the Possessed Damien, a lot of magic stuff going on in here, tying into what Joshua Williamson did with the Lazarus Island and Mother Soul and the Al Ghouls. I don't know. I just kind of felt like I get a little bit lost when they get too much into the magic. They did shine some light on what's going on with Alfred here, if you guys remember what I talked about for issue one. I'll still read it. I just didn't really love this issue. Speaking of loving issues, though, Jurassic League ends here, y'all, with issue six. Johnson, Gideon, and Spicer, they got to make an action figure series of these characters. I would totally buy it. This is obviously the big confrontation. The Jurassic League has to team up together to take down the dark side of Colopsis or whatever they called him. Love the artwork. Uh, the story was a little bit thin. It's what if the Justice League were prehistoric monsters and how they're interacting with humans. And it gives me primal rage vibes. That's what I couldn't put my finger on. I did enjoy it. Then we have a Dark Crisis tie-in. This is the uh, Worlds Without a Justice League Green Arrow edition. Stephanie Phillips, Henry, and Mayalo. So the Justice League died, but those characters didn't really die. They were just placed off into these perfect worlds. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing how Green Arrow and Black Canary kind of are soulmates and always will reconnect whatever world they're on. And we're going to get a vision of all of the Justice League characters and what it would be like without them and where they're at on whatever perfect world. So if you guys recall, they're on these perfect worlds to kind of take them off of the board. They've got to fight that urge to come back and fight the real threat with the um, Pariah and the Dark Crisis army hope you guys are with me on that i hope i got that right then we go to batman incorporated issue one so this is the new batman incorporated led by the ghost maker spinning out of the tiny and batman run this is by ed breeson tims and locus i knew i wasn't really gonna like this and i was kind of right i don't like international batman all these different batmans of japan batman of china it's just kind of goofy for me i don't even remember what the main threat was here but i wasn't really digging it probably won't continue reading that and the last one from DC is The Flash, issue two out of three, The Fastest Man Alive by Porter and Ferreira. Super strong Flash run, which is supposed to be like a movie prequel. I thought it was really dope, man. It's, um, 
I guess you would say the Ezra Miller version of Flash from the Justice League. He's new to being a, a crime fighter, and now he's kind of got Spider-Man No Way Home. No, I'm sorry, Spider-Man No More issues where his powers are skitzing out and he can't help from vibrating and trying to learn his new power set is really what's going on here. I like the whole villain, the monstrous abomination brother of the crime boss uh, and his rise to power. It was surprisingly a great issue, just like issue one. So you should give this new Flash three-issue miniseries a shot. Moving on over to the indies from Boom Studios, we have The Approach, issue one. This is by Han, Hurley, Hervis, and Weldly. Weldly. Dope issue, man. I read the synopsis in my pull list video. So you basically have this crazy blizzard. A plane has to land there, and everybody has to ha kind of hunker down in the airport. There's no power. Uh, they're snowed in, and all of a sudden, this other plane shows up that's not supposed to show up, crash lands, and they find out it's a plane that was lost 27 years ago, and there is some kind of supernatural aspect. Something is has taken over the bodies, uh, uh, remaining bodies of this plane, and we don't know what it's going to do yet, but we can imagine it ain't going to be good. All right, moving on to image. We have Seven Sons Part 5. This is by Robert Windham and Kevin Mao, Jay Lee, and June Chung. So this is the big revelation, right? Seven Sons are the seven um, siblings of Jesus Christ, but we find out that that's not all that it seems having to do with cloning. And what looked like the bad guys, I guess you would say, the, you know, the people from the Muslim religion ended up really being the good guys here and trying to help Delph, one of the uh, siblings, to save them and tell the world of this lie and facade that has been sold to them. So interesting stuff happening with Seven Sons kind of threw you for a little bit of a loop with a little bit of a twist here. I dug it. Then we're going to move on over to a new number one hit, Tomi, by H.S. Tak and Isabel Mazanti. So it's just like what the synopsis read. You have this Ronin warrior that's traveling from land to land. It gave me Usagi Yojimbo vibes. She's on the hunt for this samurai whose skin is dark as beetroot, who she remembers as a child killed her family. So she's got her revenge. She's out there looking for this samurai, and she finds him but doesn't really realize it yet. So interesting premise here. I'm going to read issue two for sure. And before we get into the gem of the week, open enrollment is live for the October mystery mail call. Not only will you receive comics at random, but you'll also receive a Something is Killing the Children issue 25 exclusive Comic Tom variant with art done by David Mack. In addition to that, you'll also receive one kid's comic with an exclusive cover by Nate Made It. The box is $34.99 plus $10 priority shipping, and international customers have an opportunity to get a box through Whatnot. All right, guys, Gem of the Week is here. I got to stop spoiling these on Twitter. If you're following me over on Twitter, I apologize. But do a powerbomb. Issue number five by Daniel Warren Johnson and Mike Spicer. I have never been on the edge of my seat reading a comic book. And I am not even like a wrestling fan. For real. Like, I like wrestling, but I didn't grow up watching it. I can only imagine how hardcore wrestling fans feel about this series. If I'm that into it, y'all got to love it, man. There's seven issues in here. This is issue five. Powerful stuff here. The action scenes were amazing. Uh, the revelation of the tag team partner that was responsible for her mother's death. She finds out what we already knew is that that's her father. Now, how did she not know that was her father the whole time based on how he looks? I don't know. That's kind of whatever. But she finds that out. And look at this cover. This is the ultimate slug match or slug fest or whatever you want to call it breaking out all the stops all of the weapons and you know we're fighting for a good cause here if she wins she can resurrect her mother and his wife now she realizes but the other people are fighting for something similar so it's not that you're just fighting these evil people they have loved ones that they lost as well and we find out a lot about their opponents in this issue I can't wait to see where issue six goes and the conclusion on issue seven. Do a power bomb is the gem of the week. Appreciate you guys watching. Let me know what your favorite comics were in the comments down below, and I'll catch you guys on whatnot later. Stay minty fresh. Peace.